Hello, everyone, and welcome back. This is the Echoes Unlimited podcast. I'm your host, Terrence Eccles, and thank you so much for clicking on the video. This is a great video for you. This is a great episode uh, with one of my very good friends, very good coworkers. Her name is Emma Maloney. Emma is the current communications intern for the Cleveland Guardians. Uh, she comes from a great background in sports media and sports journalism. Uh, going to the University of Missouri. Emma and I talk a lot about content creation as well as career paths, what it's like to live in Cleveland. Uh, So please take some time to check it out and learn more about Emma. Before the podcast starts though, I would really like to ask that you please, please, please subscribe to the channel. Please leave a like on the video. Please uh, listen on Spotify and Apple Podcasts if you can, and please support in any way you can. Please bear with us. Emma was such a trooper throughout this whole entire episode. Uh, She had probably half a voice for the first half of it. Like half a voice for this, so. And then she she finally, her voice finally came back midway through the podcast, which is great. Um, But yeah, please bear with us. She did a great job. Thanks for listening and enjoy. This is your first time doing a podcast? Um, I mean, I had like a radio show in college, but yeah, like doing someone else's podcast. We haven't talked about this. I don't think so. This radio show? I had like a radio show for like a year, yeah. So year what did you talk about on this radio show? So it's through my college's like sports radio. So they had like a radio station and then they had news and music and sports. Yeah. And so I did sports, and once you were there, like, a semester, you got, like, a certain number of hours, like, calling games, you could apply for a show, and you'd have to, like, pitch your idea, you'd have to get your, like, co-host approved or whatever, and then based on, like, the content of what you were talking about and how, like, seniority-based, you'd get a slot during the day. So oh, it was, nice. like, an hour long, and there were only two girls in the entire sports section of the radio, and her and I were, like, super close, like, that was my college best friend. So we just talked baseball for an hour. Right. Yeah. And I, it was a league of your own, right? Yeah. Okay. Was, yeah. It was one of my favorite movies. But. Gotcha. Perfect. Tom Hanks. Shout out to him. <laughs> awesome. Um, but no, that's crazy. Like you had to like audition basically mm-hmm. to get a spot on your school's radio. It's crazy. And like we were the first ever all female show. Yeah. Which in, is. In, in like 20, like I think 2019 at that time, which is crazy. Yeah. Are you going to get a plaque? Oh, I wish we had a plaque. We were part of, so her and I were part of the first all-female broadcast team mm-hmm. because it was her and I, um, like, doing the actual, like, color and play-by-play, and then there was one other um, non-binary member of the radio station that was our producer for that game. Mm. So we were, I guess for the par- part of the first all, like, non-male gotcha. broadcast, and then we were the first all-female radio show. Really cool. Yeah. That's, like, something that you should, like... Do. It's, it's pretty neat, but it's, like, very low-key. Like, I don't think we're, like, remembered for that. I mean, maybe. I don't know. I don't, like... Probably should be. It'd be neat. Yeah. yeah. Like... It's, like, so, okay. So, like, getting into that space, did you have, like, female or even male, like, role models or people, like, you would look up to and, like, want to emulate? Or was it just, like, this is something I love to do. I'm just going to do it. I think so. I've never done, like, any kind of broadcast when I was in high school. It was just, like, sports journalism. And when I got to school, they had all these, like, career fairs and, like, extracurricular fairs and stuff like that. To be like, oh, here are different options you can do. And that was something that, like, people did. And I had actually met her there at that meeting. Mm -hmm. And so we were both, like, kind of like, okay, like, this is fun. It seems it was very relaxed, which was nice. Like, it was just a relaxed environment. You go to meetings. You get to, like, interact with sports. And that was, like, really accessible. Mm -hmm. And so that's how we kind of got into it and then we had a few like older senior guys that were like the in like the uh i don't know what word i'm trying to say but like there was like a president and like a vice president oh like like the e-board yes okay and so um we were closer with them because they had to like more so make the effort to reach out to us we were Mm -hmm. close with them then that made it like really accessible for us to be part of that like organization Perfect, yeah. What did you, so you grew up on a farm in Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> what was okay. your, what, what were your experiences like growing up with sports and playing sports and, and having that access to sports? Because I know it's probably hard, you know, 
with the lack of resources on the farm. Well, not lack of resources, yeah. but lack of, like, sports facilities on the farm. So, like, my dad's side has the farm. It's, like, two hours from where I live. Okay. So, like, but in Missouri in general, like, it, that's still an applicable thing. Like, mm -hmm. I l was very lucky to live in, like, a town where it's a college town, so it's, like, larger. There's resources there, but it's not, like, a city where it's just, like, everywhere. Yeah. And so, but coming from, like, small town mentality and stuff like that like the sports that you do have are like everything yeah and so like football is huge baseball is huge um travel softball which is what i ended up playing is like shockingly huge really and, yeah it's like it's a thing I, it's like you imagine like the dance moms type stuff yeah. but with travel softball and another thing about travel softball that I never realized is how intense, like, the chants and everything get. Mm -hmm. Everything's intense. The, like, the RBI girls, like, mm -hmm. unbelievable. You say some mean stuff, too. Oh, and really? And you mean it. Yeah, like, like, all bets are off. Like, it's it's girls that are, like, young enough to, like, not have any, like, control over, like, their mental and emotions at all times. Mm -hmm. But you're in, like, an extremely competitive and, like, pressure-centric environment. Mm -hmm. Of just like athletics and then girls competing and like you're competing to either like be the best in what you're doing now or you're competing for like a future like college. Yeah. And stuff like that. And so and like that's it. Like with softball, especially like pro softball isn't really huge. Yeah. And so like getting to college ball is like the epitome. Right. So Yeah. And you know, you look at some when it's it's kind of a you know, not a it's kind of upsetting to see like how for women's sports and, and women in sports, like the the pinnacle, I guess you would say, mm -hmm. is the college level. Like you see yeah. millions and millions of people tune in to watch, you know, these college basketball, you know, Nash the mm -hmm. Caitlin Clark, Brianna Stewart, like when they're in college and then once they reach the WNBA, it's like the viewership just drops off the cliff. Yeah. That's, so. It's crazy. I and mean, like with softball too, like you think of like all the like little kids and stuff. Like when my brother plays baseball. Like, he has all these like MLB players to look up to. Mm -hmm. And like with the exception of like some of the women's softball players that have played on like the U.S. team, mm -hmm. so I'm thinking like pitchers like Jenny Finch. Like everyone yeah. knows who that is. Monica Abbott. Yes. Yeah. But like you know like the uh, names on one hand. Yeah. And that's it. And that's it's just all I know. not a thing. Like I don't even know if I could name like the names of professional softball teams mm -hmm. and there's maybe like 10 of them yeah like it's just crazy like it's a completely different type of thing just because it's like you don't have your like big time role models to look up to all the time mm -hmm. right so you just have to basically like find your own path mm -hmm. and find your own sort of motivation and stuff so what type of stuff did motivate you at that time period oh man um i was really competitive so yeah like that I went from, like, rec ball to where it was just, like, kind of for fun to, like, getting into a travel ball situation where, like, every game mattered and, like, it was way more important to, like, be better, be best, like, all that kind of stuff. And so then, like, my dad was also my coach. Oh. And so it was, like, getting to, like, bring my whole family into it was just, like, it made it fun for me. But it was also something that I was, like, this makes it mean so much more when I'm, like, playing and especially doing well. Mm -hmm. I'm, like, oh, my whole family's here. Like, my dad's, like, telling me what to do, like that kind of stuff so it's like more of an intrinsic like drive i guess mm. and that's great that you have like sort of like your softball games became like a family affair oh yeah and, everyone was there right and then having their support and i'm sure that that meant a lot and you know not a lot of girls have it like mm -hmm. that and it's unfortunate because um you know i've seen it in the male side as well where it's like kid shows up his mom will show up maybe once every yeah. three games where it's like when you get your whole family there, it's like it means something mm -hmm. more. I'm not so. have like teammates like that too, but then that's where like the resources things come in. Like mm -hmm. thinking about like the tournaments that I went to, how much we paid to play in like tournaments and rec leagues and competitive leagues, like travel tri like trips from not just like Columbia to Kansas City, which is two hours, but like we went to Colorado a summer. Yeah. And I was like, you have to be able to afford that. And I think there's like, that's a side that people don't really think about is like, especially in like rural areas especially in like poverty areas like people cannot afford to play club sports like that and get the opportunities that those then like give you whether that applies to like going into high school sports where you have this advantage if you played for years but you paid to play for years right or like if you're looking to be a professional athlete a collegiate athlete like you have to pay to get to that level too yeah 
big time. And, you know, I remember some of the AAU checks my mom would write were crazy. Mm -hmm. Like, I couldn't believe, like, and that's like a true testament to, like, how much your parents love you and how much your parents believe in you. As a kid, you don't understand that. You're just like, oh, I have softball practice today. Like, I'm going to the field, but you don't think about the cleats that your parents paid for that you're putting on, the doll bag full of stuff that your parents paid for. Like, Mm -hmm. at 12 years old, I'm not going to be able to buy a $300 bat. Yeah. But a lot of families wouldn't be able to buy a $300 bat for their kid either. Mm -hmm. So it's like something that I feel very fortunate about, but I don't think it's something I've thought about until very recently. And, Mm -hmm. like, I mean, I have two other siblings that also have played club ball. Right. So just thinking about, like, how lucky all three of us have been to be able to, like, do that is insane. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, you think about that plus like gas it takes to take you to mm-hmm. tournaments and hotels. Hotels, mm-hmm. it's ridiculous. Yeah. And, um, the different gear and everything, and um, you know, softball is probably a little bit more expensive than basketball, where it's like all you need is like sneakers. shoes and a ball. Yeah. yeah. And I, no, I mean, I'm gonna throw shots at my brother. Honestly, the fact that he wasn't, he he wasn't like the player to want to play like mm-hmm. AAU or go to on travel leagues and, and yeah. play all these expensive sports. Like I play lacrosse, baseball, mm-hmm. football, all this stuff. So, um, you know, it was a blessing to just have my parents like want to pour all of this into oh, me. Yeah. And it's like, well, he's not necessarily getting that because he doesn't do it. Yes. So it's like, it's like a bit of, I don't, I don't want to say it's like a burden. It's like, you feel a sense of responsibility mm-hmm. to like perform for your, not only your teammates yeah. and your coaches, but your parents. Well, as to well. make it worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Because th- you want them to get back what they've invested mm-hmm. in. So it's, I think that's like a huge thing with athletes where it's like a lot of people are going to invest a lot into mm-hmm. you. So you like want to give that, make sure that they get the return on their investment. Yeah. No, so, I completely understand that. Yeah. So grateful for that. Absolutely. So let's, dive into a little bit more of like what you were doing outside of maybe sports um you know growing up in columbia missouri Mm -hmm. um you ended up deciding to go to mizzou Mm -hmm. like what are the things that you did because you you studied journalism correct Mm -hmm. so what were the things you were doing like in high school like leading up to that point that led you to want to be a journalism major at a good communication school such as mizzou Mm -hmm. that's crazy outside of sports like my whole life is sports but uh No, in high school, so we had, like, once I got later into, like, junior, senior year, like, you have the ability to do electives and, like, fun classes that aren't just, like, AP, like, preparing for college or, like, your normal requirements, like, you get some openings. And so I loved, like, our journalism teacher because I had her for, like, a some kind of homeroom type thing. Mm -hmm. So I, like, took the class and I loved it. Like, it was writing, but it was, like, all these meetings and, like, planning and, like, I was still on, like, a sports beat for them, but, like, just the creativity of it. Like, I love writing. I love reading. And so that was, like, an outlet that I could pour that into that actually for once felt, like, feasible as a job. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I did it for two years, and it was one of, like, the first things that I was, like, wow, like, I could see myself actually doing this, like, sticking with it. Like, you know, when you're a kid and you're, like, oh, I like this for a month, or, like, I want to be this for six months, and then you're totally over it. Yeah. But, like, that was the first thing, especially as I was getting to, like, 17, 16 years old, like, oh, like, I actually really do like this. Mm -hmm. And so then, like, you get into, like, all the late high school stuff where it's, like, oh, you need to, like, apply and, like, think about where you're going to go. And, honestly, Mizzou was the only place I applied for. Really? I didn't didn't even tour it. (laughs) No, I didn't do a tour. I only sent in my application for there and it was like early application stuff yeah i got my stuff back and they were like here's your financial plan like here's what you can do and like it's a world-renowned journalism school yeah and so for what i wanted to do in my hometown for a school i like loved i knew about it already and it was like touted for what i wanted to go into like kind of for me there was like no other there's no other choice yeah And, like, I didn't need there to be. Mm -hmm. So I think I could have explored other places, but I just, like, knew that was what was right. And so, like, moving from that passion to then, like, making it be like, okay, like, this is where I need to be. Mm -hmm. So that's how I ended up. Interesting. Okay. And, I mean, I'm surprised to hear that you never toured because did you just spend a lot of time on campus growing up Mm -hmm. in the the city? So my dad works there. Gotcha. And so he started part-time, I think, when I was, like, 10, 12-ish maybe, and then after a couple years, they were like, do you want to do this full-time? And so 
but also just like as a kid like you go to the quad and you watch and walk around like you watch the homecoming parade every year and you football get to games. see yeah football games baseball games like softball like you just watch everything mm-hmm. and so like growing up in the environment like you knew the school yeah and like granted i know the school in a completely different way now that i've been there mm-hmm. but it still felt just as like homey and right to me as a kid as it did when i was then like going into needing to choose a college yeah awesome and um I guess, well, I come from very, like, extremely similar situation, mm-hmm. being five minutes from the Syracuse campus, yeah. you know, similar interests coming out of high, high school, wanted to be a broadcaster. Syracuse is a great communication mm-hmm. school as well. But I still had that itch, like, oh, I want to play basketball. Mm-hmm. not good enough to play basketball at Syracuse. I'm not big enough well, to play basketball yeah. at Syracuse. Like, there's a lot of factors that go into mm-hmm. that. Like... So you playing sports all the way up to that point, like what made you like, okay, probably not a Mizzou softball player, mm-hmm. but let me just go here and focus on my academics and, and get my journalism degree. Is that just like, was, was that a tough decision or was that something you knew you had to make or is, what what went into that? Um, I think it was definitely like, I wouldn't say it was a tough decision and then like, I didn't know that I needed to make that decision and like. For me, I loved school, Mm -hmm. and so, like, academics was always, like, almost just as big to me as sports, and so I was like, I know that I can, like, continue this interest and expand it beyond just me playing it. Like, Mm -hmm. sports to me wasn't either I'm playing sports and I love sports, or I'm not playing sports, I'm not engaged with sports, Mm -hmm. and so, like, I think I was really comfortable with the idea of making that compromise and being like, I know that if I want to go where academics takes me, I'm not going to play there. Yeah. And so I think it was just a sacrifice that I was like, I understand this. I've come to terms with it. I still played basically my age up until my like freshman year of college. Right. Because I was still eligible for travel ball. Yeah. I got to like still do it. But I think by the time I'd gotten to that point, I was done with that. And I was like comfortable closing that chapter Mm -hmm. and turning my like interest into academics and like pursuing them as a whole. Right. So. And plus, like, your body starts to give up. Oh, my gosh, yeah. I was exhausted. <laughs> yeah. I just, I throw a ball now for, like, an hour, and I get in my shoulder for three days. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's like your knees, your ankles, mm-hmm. like, all of that begins to break down. And, you know, I'm, I was blessed to, like, last this long. But, like, now I really feel it. Like, I'm not even kidding. Yeah. I wear an ankle brace almost every day. I ice my feet and my, my knees and mm-hmm. my ankles all the time. And it's, like... I don't even play anymore. Yeah, <laughs> why do I feel this sore? <laughs> exactly. So, no, it's it'll, it'll take a lot out of your body. And, you know, I'm glad that you were able to, like, get that sort of, like, last go mm-hmm. where, like, you don't have to stop before you're ready and you don't have to stop after, you, like, that sort of passes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, it I, sounds to me like you stopped at the perfect time. I think so. Like, I think I would have resented it a little more had I, like, given up any kind of like academic success or trying to play softball Mm -hmm. even further. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then, um, you know, being in college, what was that experience? Like being so close to home, Mm -hmm. did you move off, you moved off camp or away from home? I did. Yeah. To campus, right? No, my parents, so like my parents were really good about that. And I think like, it's definitely unique because like I go to campus, I already know the whole city. Mm -hmm. I know the campus. I see, half of my graduating class from high school on campus and I can go out to dinner with my family every week but at the same time like kind of like what I said earlier like the campus and college that I like grew up knowing is not the same when you go to school there Mm -hmm. and you're like almost all of my friends like were not from my hometown when I like got further into college like everyone that I was meeting and like interacting with mostly were not like from nearby Mm -hmm. and so that was like really unique for me because I'm like yeah I'm showing people around my hometown I like know the places to go but I'm experiencing this now as like a college kid like I'm spending way more time downtown than I ever would have before when I was in high school I don't see my family constantly like we Mm -hmm. did dinner like once or twice a week like I got to attend like big events and stuff like that but it wasn't like they were overbearing to the point where it was just like being in high school so Mm -hmm. it's different very good and then I'm I'm sure you get to like expose your friends to like all the stuff you Mm -hmm. grew up to love did you ever bring a friend down to the farm i have not brought like 
none of my friends that have been to the farm like hadn't been there oh okay so like i had like some childhood friends that i brought down to the farm and like a past boyfriend i brought down to the farm but otherwise like the farm is pretty sacred to me so yeah. like if you're reading my family and you're going to the farm like we're, we're like this you gotta be a real one yeah so. okay you gotta be twinning them you got oh do you want to go to the farm i would l- yeah emma i know you want to see the next cows. time i'm in missouri okay. i swear if, it's easy yeah we'll just you'll drive have down, me down there. to the farm yes mm-hmm. that would that would be amazing <laughs> okay perfect um so we're good now you, now that you've got the farm in we're good to go yeah exactly now you know we locked in <laughs> a lot of i mean i'm sure you probably had your fair share of college experiences mm-hmm. that are just like like stuff happens in college that you're like never expect yeah you know what i mean mm-hmm. and like in terms of the stuff the extracurriculars and stuff you did as well like um what are some like college experiences that you'll probably never forget or like people you cherish or things like that so Mizzou is like unique i don't know if a lot of other schools do this i'd assume no but as part of their like actual journalism curriculum depending on if you're going through like broadcast or print you actually work during like the semester at either the local broadcast station or at the local newspaper yep. and like you're not paid but you're like basically like a full-time reporter and so my like first semester doing that i covered my high school yeah. like i like oh, went cool. as like a college student now and like wrote about their basketball team i wrote about another like rival high school's football team like i'm covering my brother's friends Oh, at oh that's awesome. And it's insane. Yeah. Yeah. So getting to do that was super cool. And then the next semester, you, you kind of like level up. And so then I was a reporter for Mizzou Baseball. Oh, nice. And so that was also crazy because it's like, okay, I've been going to these games like as a fan. Like, that's my sport. I've like chosen this team to like be a fan of. And now having to be like, okay, now I'm like a reporter. Like, this isn't my team anymore. Like, I need to cover this team. Right. It was super neat. Mm-hmm. And granted, that was during COVID, so. Mm-hmm. derailed totally crazy but just like getting that experience of like working at a newspaper at like 19 years old and you're covering people that you've grown up with you're covering schools like i knew stories i knew rivalries i knew people i had contacts because i'd grown up perfect. there yeah and so like i could access this like whole arena of like resources to become this like writer and it was so like unique and interesting and so much fun mm-hmm. it was a lot like, it was very stressful and, like, that part shouldn't be glazed over because it's, like, a, a huge expectation and a yeah. lot of work. Yeah. But that is, like, one of the most, like, incredible experiences as, like, someone, like, pursuing a career in that field that I've had. hmm Yeah. And, I mean, you you mentioned, like, just working for the team that you, like, grew up watching mm-hmm. and grew up, like, around and, like, having to cover them through an objective lens is probably, like, it was crazy. One of the kids on the team I went to elementary school with. Oh, my God. So I have, like, known this guy since he was five years old. Yeah. And now I'm having to reach out to him and tell him that I want to write a feature on him and his family. Yeah. Like, can I have your teammates, like, contacts to reach out to them? Or, like, hi, like, I'm covering this team. I, I need story ideas. Yeah. And I'm saying that to someone, like, having to communicate to them as a professional for someone that I've known since they were in glasses and four feet tall. Yeah. Like, that's crazy. Yeah. So. And I mean, I guess that just comes with like working in media and working, mm-hmm. uh, especially in sports media. It's like you, you realize like people are people and people like you have to like be ingrained in it. Whereas mm-hmm. like, I know people who cover things like that are in other aspects of entertainment, like say it's like a music artist or a actor or something mm-hmm. like that you don't really like follow them around on like a daily basis or go to their like rehearsals and stuff like yeah. that you're just like okay this is their performance in this this is their performance in mm-hmm. that talking about their music talking about their art whereas like when you're covering a sports team you're like showing up in the locker room you're showing up to clubhouse showing up at practice showing yeah. up at games like before games after games like you have to like mm-hmm. pay attention to a lot of like the intricacies yeah i think it's a very unique balance with teams of like i mean we've talked about this like covering people as their people not just athletes not just whoever they are but it's like this balance where you're entering their very public but also their professional space Mm -hmm. and so yeah you're at these practices you're at these games like you're seeing them in their most like intensely competitive and professional moments but then you also have to remember that like part of the intrigue and interest there is that they're people and so you also have to be granted access to these personal spaces as well yeah and that's like such 
I feel like that's such like an intimate thing for someone to be like, I'm reporting on you or I'm covering or I'm trying to showcase you as a person, but also you as a public figure mm -hmm. in whatever arena you're in. And I think that's crazy. Just having to like balance that and like approach it with that kind of lens. Not just like, I'm approaching it. This is a football player. I'm approaching it. This is like, Bill, you're like, I'm approaching this as build a football player. And you have mm -hmm. to have this like cohesive whole. Right. Right. And I mean, I'm sure that is like something that, you know, school prepares you for mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the different journalism classes and everything that, that sort of like gets you ready for all that. Um, what made you, so you finish your master, you finish your bachelor's the same year I did, even though you're a year younger. Mm -hmm. um, so you finish that early, decide to go back, get your master's, you finish that in December. Mm -hmm. And then you make the quick turnaround now that i think about it this is such a quick turnaround yeah. from like school it was crazy to your first job mm -hmm. in january of 2023 and you're working for the cleveland guardians yeah and i'm not going to expose you and say what accounts <laughs> you worked on but you you are a big part of our social team and our yeah. social space and, and what we do on, on the guardian social accounts um what like what made you want to like sort of make the turn from like sort of recovering like or not recovering you know, but like covering fair. like teams yeah recovering. <laughs> recovering is fair but yeah um what makes you like want to make the switch or like turn from covering players and teams and sports and stuff like that to like being like a social creator for mm -hmm. for those teams i think so one like reporting did get exhausting like it's a crazy schedule you're covering games you're writing features like it was crazy and so i do think i got a little bit burnt out which is why for my like master's degree i pursued communications so, like marketing advertising and i got more into like, copywriting which is way more like short form creative very punchy copy and that's mm -hmm. completely different than writing yep. a 500 word feature story yep. and so getting it to combine those was really unique and I had not worked in social. Mm -hmm. And so I got an internship with an interior design firm, Okay. which was very out there, but it was very like communications based. And yeah. so, like I helped write their blog posts. I helped write emails. I helped with social, like I got to access that field of it. And so combining those two and then knowing that I also wanted to be in sports, like I think that all just honestly flowed me into social where it was mm -hmm. like, you have to have like an understanding of language and communication, but it's another thing where like you have to also have an awareness of like how visuals tie into this, of how graphics tie into this, about how audio visual ties into this, and then use that language in let's say like, the length of a tweet to convey what you're trying to convey. And I think it's definitely challenging, but it's like such a uniquely creative medium that mm -hmm. is also like huge. Yeah. I mean, like that's what people use now. It's exactly. not like I don't have people that are going to pick up the newspaper every day, but they're going to get on their phone and they're going to open up Instagram, Twitter, and like go and look and follow the team that they're following. Yeah. And so like using that and learning that medium to communicate has been like super cool. Yeah. So That's a great yeah. point that you bring up because like as time goes by, like even, I mean, before print journalism was like the number mm -hmm. one main thing, like print media, traditional media was like, god like mm -hmm. it was like the number one thing and i think it still is like the most spent like in terms of like what what uh companies put their money towards yeah but that's just because it, they're expensive mediums like, yes social media is pretty mm -hmm. pretty affordable um yeah. and that's why a lot of people are, are using that to grow on it and i think that was probably a smart decision like yeah say you're writing for like a website or a newspaper or something like that like you said that's kind of going away and people are more mm -hmm. going towards like what's on social let me get on social that's how i get a lot of my information granted you have to be careful what you consume on social mm -hmm. in terms of like what what's going to be good for you and, and what's going to be truthful or not yeah. but um it just takes an intelligent like eye to realize like what's, what's yeah. the best but i mean a verified Guardian's account on social media is yeah. pretty reliable. Yeah, source. so, you know, having to, like, represent that, too. But, like, yeah, like, he's, like, traditional media, it's not, like, obsolete by any means, mm -hmm. but it's just not as accessible as yeah. opening up your phone, and it's not all-encompassing like that. Like, 
you can read a news article about one subject, you can watch like the news about the same subject, but when you mm -hmm. go online, like you could have one post and it has the video clip, it yeah. has photos, it has copy. Yeah. Like it has literally all of it contained in this little package. Mm -hmm. But like like you said, like you have to be mindful of that when you're consuming it and also when you're producing it. You yeah. know, like if you're the supplier of this information and this like all encompassing information, you have to do a good job of it. Right. Because so many people are just gonna like take at face value what they find. Yeah. And you have to you have to toe the line between um being accurate and reporting the new or like reporting things while also being like creative and fun and making mm -hmm. social media what what social media is basically yeah. made for so i mean it's probably like like you said it's like a little bit trickier a little bit of a challenge but i'm sure it's going to pay off in the end in terms of mm -hmm. like how you're able to process things now that you've had this experience working for the guardians mm -hmm. which is really cool and i'm glad you're, oh, yeah. you're able to do that I definitely agree with that. It's just, yeah, it's very unique. And, like, I think with news especially, that's what people think about when they think of, like, conveying information. But, mm. like, sports, too. Like, it's not just me. I mean, sometimes it feels like me just posting a clip yeah. with a funny little caption. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, like, I'm representing a brand. Mm -hmm. I'm representing whoever I'm posting about. I'm representing their teammates. I'm representing the people that work behind the scenes with me. Yep. And I'm showcasing their work half the time just as much as I'm showcasing mine. Yep. And so, like, as a whole, like, yeah, one post is, like, nothing in the grand scheme of things. But as a whole, like, you're creating a voice. You're creating, like, a representation of so many people. Mm -hmm. that I think that's just as important as when you, like, put out a news article because people are going to latch onto their sports teams and the way they communicate and yep. what they represent just as much as they are their local news channels or their national news networks that they follow. Yeah. And I mean, one thing that we've learned in our short time here in Cleveland mm -hmm. is that for their sports teams, they do not play. Uh uh. <laughs> they do not play. That is like the number, like everyone here is, it's like from, from like the, the 80 year old grandmas to like the mm -hmm. four year old, like little boys. It's like, they live and die. They're yeah. Cleveland sports. Yes, they live and die by the Cleveland sports. And it's very, like, cool to see that. Mm -hmm. And especially in this environment, you come from a college town, I come from a college town. It's crazy to see that, like, on a professional level. Yes, too. no, I completely agree. Because, like, a lot of people understand, like, I understand why most people in Syracuse like Syracuse basketball. Yeah. Most, both of my parents went there. They both are graduates from Syracuse. Like, that's your family school. That's, like, what you live at. Exactly. But, yeah, to see that in, like, a citywide, statewide level, like, that is insane. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, like, for all the teams, too. It's, mm -hmm. like, it's not like, oh, I like Mizzou baseball and football and basketball just because, you know, I'm from Mizzou. It's, like, I like the, the Guardians, the, the Browns, and the Cavaliers who, like, the Mizzou teams have very similar branding, mm -hmm. very similar, like, sort of, you know. They're part of the Mizzou entity. Exactly. But, like, the Guardians, Cavs, and Browns are mm -hmm. so, like. They're their own thing. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's been cool to see how, like, people, like, sort of bring them all together, even though that they, they're mm -hmm. their own entities and in, in, in themselves. and. You know, they have very different brands. Yeah, so you adopt that as, like, the Cleveland sports ideology, which is another thing. Like, you're representing the fans just as much mm -hmm. when you're part of the organization, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, we're talking a lot about, like, the amazing aspects of, like, Cleveland fans and everything. But what made you want to work for the Guardians in Cleveland? Oh, well, I, I knew MLB. Like, yeah. baseball's my sport. That's what I grew up watching and playing, like, just being in love with. And so... MLB was a very hard, like, line for me, and, like, that's where I need to be. Yeah. And so taking advantage of the opportunities and, like, applying to these MLB jobs. But this organization, like, it's so welcoming. I mean, like, you can attest to everything I'm going to say. Like, it's so welcoming. It's so um, accessible in the way that, like, you can express your needs as a professional. You can express your needs as a person, mm -hmm. and they're going to be super receptive to that. And so it's, like, this incredibly like rare balance of i'm getting such incredible professional experience in an environment that would like never be punishing towards me mm -hmm. and i think that's 
such a crazy thing, especially in sports. Yeah. Especially as like a woman in sports. Yeah. Like I just think that's something that I could have never imagined I'd luck into in professional sports, feeling so like supportive professionally and just like individually. Yeah. And having this outlet given to me where I can just be creative and like learn at the same time and not like be scared to be either one of those things is great. Mm-hmm. And I think what, what the Guardians do is they, they sort of beat all of the um, preconceived notions about working for a mm-hmm. sports team, especially in a state like Ohio, where it's like in, in New York, like we have a, a perception of Ohio and we have a perception of teams like, mm-hmm. well, for a long time, the Indians and, and the Browns and the, and the Cavs were a little bit different, but like yeah. we have a perception of those teams and their fans and, and probably we don't know the people who work in the organiza- organization, but mm-hmm. we can like assume but once you get in the organization, it's a very diverse, like like you said, just inviting, like yeah. accessible is a great word as well. It's like, it's a top-notch it's organization. So yeah. It's, yeah. Like, it's just so comfortable. Yeah. And that's it. It's nothing I would have ever expected. Yeah. Especially, like, my first job at school. Right. I feel so lucky to, like, have the people in the environment that I do. And I am, like, in awe that it exists. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's It's true blessing mm-hmm. like i can i cannot express that enough in, in how well this organization is run um so when it came to like you drove all the way here or did you fly when uh for your interviews i drove you drove all the way yeah. to cleveland for your interviews i mean that shows in itself like how much you wanted this type of job and how mm-hmm. much you wanted to work in this environment that was the point yeah right <laughs> i was trying to show i was committed <laughs> yeah and how long? How long is that? Ten hours. Ten. You drove ten hours to Cleveland just to interview mm-hmm. uh, for a job that you didn't even know if you were going to get. Yeah. And, I mean, just what were your like ideas or sort of what was Cleveland's reputation in your mind going in, and how did that sort of change as you? got here and checked it out and got to see Cleveland. Mm-hmm. Like, not necessarily the organization, I guess a little bit of that, but, yeah. like, just Cleveland itself too. in Ohio. I, so, like, maybe it's just, like, the bubble, but, like, I didn't live anywhere besides my hometown. Mm-hmm. And it's Missouri. I know Missouri, but outside of the Missouri bubble, like, I didn't live or stayed long term anywhere. I'd never set foot in the state of Ohio. Yeah. Until <laughs> I drove up for my interviews. I didn't know anything about Cleveland. Like, I knew the names of the sports teams. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty much it. And so, like, I get here, the whole drive feels very Midwest. I get here, and it's, like, quintessential Midwest city. Yeah. Like, I'm a Midwest girl, and so I'm, like, I love this. But it was, like, even coming for, I think I was here maybe 48 hours. Mm-hmm. And. Like, yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, I was, so I went with my dad, mm-hmm. and first night, took a walk around the city. We found a restaurant by a chef that I grew up watching on Food Network. Oh, my gosh. It's just my dad and I going out for a barbecue dinner. Yeah. Everyone's so nice, giving, yeah. giving us recs. Not mm-hmm. even, like, I got dinner recs, obviously, when I came for my interviews, but yeah. even the lady at the restaurant is giving us dinner recommendations, places to go. To be like, what are you doing here? Like, yeah. talking, just chatting. And so, like, it felt so friendly. The city downtown is where we were staying, and then we were right by the stadium, obviously, as well. But walking around at the time, like, I didn't know that it was public square. Yep. That's where I'd be living. Mm-hmm. But walking around downtown and I'm like, this is cool architecture. This is such a pretty area. And it's like winter. Yeah. I mean, it's January right. at this point. And so just like kind of taking it all in. But we went to, I think I went to four different restaurants in the two days that I was here. Oh, wow. And like walking down by the river and going to a brewery down there walking to or not walking going to Tremont and getting breakfast at a cozy little diner yeah. the next morning in like this homely neighborhood and then enjoying the city like it just was like all the little bits and pieces of like homeliness in Tremont mm-hmm. the like up and coming college town vibe of Ohio City and then like the bustling like downtown vibe yeah. of like downtown Cleveland mm-hmm. just encompassed like everything that I was, like, needing to create this hole that felt good to me. Mm-hmm. And so it was such a cool thing, like, coming to the city and not feeling overwhelmed. Yeah, Like, you drive through, I mean, I haven't been to New York, but I'm thinking, like, Chicago. Even oh, downtown yeah. St. Louis, like, you get and you're just overwhelmed. You have no idea where to go. Yep. Like, 
There's just so you much going on around are. you. You don't know It's so big. Yeah, and I just, I don't feel that way here. Yeah. And it's not to say that there's not a lot going on, and there's mm-hmm. not a lot to do or see, but it doesn't make you feel as though that's, like, suffocating you. Yes, yes. I definitely feel like, um, you know, being someone who's from upstate New York and then going to school downstate, like, mm-hmm. spent fair share of time in New York City, not, not nearly as much as some of my classmates who are there every weekend. Yeah. But it's like... Yeah, you walk in New York City and, like, it it takes, like, months or not probably not even months, years yeah. to really, like, develop a sense of, like, where you are in the city. And then don't even talk, don't even think about driving anywhere. Oh, my goodness, no. Or, or finding some, you know, nice scenery to, like, mm-hmm. or greenery outside of Central Park. Yeah. You know? Like, you'd You're have to go... not going to find a patch of grass anywhere. Exactly, exactly. And, and like, I guess that sort of is, like... Um, I don't know about you. I'm such a control freak. I like, I love to control my environment mm-hmm. in terms of like, I need to be this place at this time. And then I can, I like having the flexibility of being able to leave whatever yeah. and, and go at my own pace and mm-hmm. go at my own, own, own tip. Whereas like New York, you're, you're like, say you're leaving dinner, you have to find a subway stop and you have to figure out like where you're going to go. Oh, like yeah. you have to figure out which train, which station you have to be at, like, the logistics it's, of that are not for me. It, it's quite stressful, and I'm grateful to have people who are very familiar with the city mm-hmm. the few times that I've gone. But, like, can you imagine, like, navigating yourself in that area? Yeah. Whereas, like, here is pretty pretty easy to navigate, yes. wouldn't you say? Oh, I completely agree. Like, I can drive downtown, mm-hmm. and, like, there's construction. Like, you're moving around people. You're moving around stuff like that. But you know your routes. You know alternative routes. Mm-hmm. Like, I can get to where I'm going without maps now most of the time and it's been oh, nice. like five months yeah and i just think that's not something i would have been able to figure out had i felt like overwhelmed or confused by anything within a bigger city mm-hmm. and then the traffic issue as well yeah like, like it's huge like my my brother just moved to philadelphia he didn't even think about bringing a car he's like i'm leaving my car at I don't mess with you guys it. can yeah. do what you want sell it do whatever i'm not even going to think about it mm-hmm. whereas like here it's like convenient to own a car oh, yeah. whereas like in in a different city it's like a bit of a hassle yeah you have to find parking you have to pay for parking Mm -hmm. um whereas like here it's like it's great it's not like the biggest struggle of my life to get out and drive to the target yeah like i can just do that yeah exactly like you don't have to like plan like okay this is time of day it's not Uh gonna be very packed yeah perfect absolutely perfect so definitely a lot of love uh for cleveland Mm -hmm. what was it like sort of um you mentioned it was your first time stepping foot in the state of Ohio. Like, what was it like, just like, or what I, What has it been like? Because it's your first time being, like, very far away from mm-hmm. home. Like, what was it like just, like, being, like, because you have to have a certain mindset to do that. Yeah. To be like, I'm going to leave home at 22 years old and not look back, go for this job opportunity. Yeah. Uh, it's my first time outside the state. Like, what was that like? It's definitely saying I'm still, like, building like, I was very close to my family. My entire family lives in Missouri, save for a set of two cousins. Okay. And so everyone that, like, I've grown up with, my siblings, my family, my cousins, my grandparents, every single person is in Missouri. All of my friends are in Missouri. And so it was one of those things where I had to really, like, tell myself and, like, have the conversation about, like, is this what you want to be doing and is it worth it to leave, like, support structures 10 hours away Mm -hmm. and it's not to say they're not like still support structures for me like they're still very accessible to me I see them as much as I possibly can but it was just like a hurdle to come to terms with that like letting my sense of like adventure and professional purpose win out over the fear of like leaving and changing things Mm -hmm. and it's something I'm definitely still building yeah but I do think that like having people in a work environment that embraced me here made that transition way easier Mm -hmm. because I would have gotten here and felt so uncomfortable felt suffocated just like not felt like I had a community in Cleveland Mm -hmm. I think I would have hated it yeah but because I come into such an environment that is so supportive and like welcoming to me and pairing that with the idea that like I'm doing what I've always wanted to do since I decided that this is like my path Mm -hmm. I think it's just made it way easier and way more worth it to me that's great and I mean yeah, the, now that you've mentioned it, like, just the comfortability of, like, having the people here in this organization mm-hmm. is 
definitely has definitely made the transition a lot easier. Yeah, absolutely. And like in me, like I'm sure a couple of the guys have met like your family members and, and stuff. And mm-hmm. I know I, yeah, I yeah. met your brother. You met my brother. Yeah. <laughs> um, like in, in sort of like just seeing that those types of interactions, it's like, okay, like if my dad is comfortable you know, with Court and Austin, like, mm-hmm. I feel like... I can be comfortable with Court. Right, yeah. exactly, exactly, in, in sort of a long-term, mm-hmm. more, um, more more situation. Um, we, I know we alluded to this earlier, and we, we mentioned it, but I want to just bring this up again. Um, being one of, being in a sport that is extremely male-dominated, I mean, there's only male players in the MLB, mm-hmm. um, baseball is you know, a very traditional, like, classic type of sport, mm-hmm. like, not really, until this, until last season, like, it didn't really seem like baseball was adjusting with the times, and mm-hmm. it sort of was getting left in the past, whereas, mm-hmm. like, now you've seen this whole resurgence in the sport, where it's, like, pace of play, these, um, new pitch clock, all this yeah. new stuff that's making it cool, like, player interviews during the middle of a game, like, yeah, really cool, like, Baseball is becoming more and more innovative and is trying to, like, showcase some of their, like, big stars and big players. Mm-hmm. What was it like coming into, like, such a traditional, like, old-timey sport, being, like, a young woman straight out of college where it's, like, this is my first experience. Like, it's not like you're coming in here, it's like, oh, I have this wealth of experience yeah. in the sport. Like, I'm going to be able to, like, navigate it myself. Where it's, like, you're coming in as, like, the only woman in our room, mm-hmm. the one of the very few in our entire like department. Mm-hmm. So what what has that been like for you? I think it was definitely intimidating at first because I'd come off of three years of working on a thesis all about how like s- sports are not accessible as much as they should be to women. Mm-hmm. And so like hearing testimonies from my interviewees about like their positive experiences, yes, but also like the negatives and the hurdles they faced and like basically doing an updated take on what the sports arena looks like for women right now Mm -hmm. it was something that i think i luckily was very realistic about in my mind um so it's definitely intimidating just because like you know you're most likely going to be the minority Mm -hmm. and like coming from a position where i've always felt like very lucky and very privileged in my position in my schooling like in growing up with sports like i've always felt like very privileged and like known where my like advantages were coming knowingly going into a situation where I thought I might potentially be at a disadvantage was definitely like it's it's a little anxiety inducing but again like just turning the organization like I didn't come into somewhere where I felt like I had to work to make myself feel seen it was like Mm -hmm. I was seen yeah and I think going into that made it way like easier and kind of calm those nerves there's definitely always a thought in your mind like not necessarily like oh because I'm a girl, mm-hmm. but just like the inherent need to like represent yourself in a like certain way and like be perfect and make sure your work's like of the highest quality. Right. And I'm not nece- like I don't necessarily think that goes along with just being a woman, but it's right. one of those things where like you just kind of absorb. Mm-hmm. And so I think that pressure is always there, but it was a lot more like settling for me mm-hmm. to come into an organization where I didn't have like I wasn't feeling uncomfortable because there weren't as many women because there's still women that you see and you talk to but you can also talk to people that aren't women yeah and it's just everyone again is so accessible and welcoming and they're like automatically proud of you yeah so it's like right i didn't have to worry about that as much as if i would have gone into another like another baseball organization or another sport that's very like male dominated. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's like, it's pros and cons. Like the thought is always there, and the expectations always there. But I do think that like, I'm realistically very lucky and very honest with myself about like the organization that I've been a part of, mm-hmm. and like how they've made that barrier feel like it's not there for me. Right, and I'm sure there's so many preconceived notions that that people have, and I'm I mean I know you that you hold yourself to very high standards Mm -hmm. and very high levels. So it's like, it's not like ever like a concern going in, but, um, you know, just there are different things or different, um, characteristics that come with certain stereotypes and certain like ideas. Whereas like, you know, being a woman, it's like, 
oh, maybe she doesn't know much about baseball. Whereas, mm-hmm. like, that's a sport you've followed your entire life. You've been a lifelong Cardinals yeah. fan. Like, you've watched all the games. Like, they were in World Series when you were a kid. Like, mm-hmm. you were, you grew up, like, around this sport. And, like, you probably hold, already held yourself to a high standard of, like, already knowing what's going around, mm-hmm. uh, going on around the league. Already knowing, like, all the new, like... Um, changes within the sport and already knowing like the impactful players and mm-hmm. and what a different stat means and what this types of stuff so that's probably like a preconceived notion that I can think off the top of my head where it's like it's probably something that people will like go in and think like oh a woman doesn't know that yeah so it's but it's like since you have already held yourself to that standard it's like oh well I, I know this I, I do yeah. yeah like I do know this exactly mm-hmm. exactly and probably gives you more confidence seeing like anyone who would doubt you because i i know for me personally there's some preconceived notions about you know people who look yeah. like me where it's like oh he's probably not that intelligent or something like that where it's like you have to like be above and beyond and you like have mm-hmm. to exceed that and it's it's a bit of like a burden i guess yeah or in in well, holding yourself to that standard mm-hmm. anyways and, and being so knowledgeable. Um, but it, at the end of the day, like, it pays off when you're able to, like, show people. Yeah. Like, you you got this on your own merit. Mm-hmm. Like, you're you're able to contribute at a very high level. And yeah. It's, 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 a test, it's a true testament to, like, yeah. the type of person you are. So, very good. I'm We're doing good. You're doing great. I, I'd say you're doing great. I'd it, say you're doing great. Thank you, thank you. If you put me on your thing, I would have give you a ten out of ten. But oh, you didn't put I me know. on your thing. I'm sorry, I didn't know I could pick more than three. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> it happens. It happens. But um, we talk a lot about you know like your early career in sports. Mm-hmm. What do you want to? What is like a career goal of yours? Like what? Do, what would you like to see? Like mm. Emma Maloney did this. Oh man, um, which is so crazy to me because I feel like I'm doing like my peak job right now yeah um i would say like again mlb is where i want to be like Mm -hmm. i'm thrilled if i'm somewhere but i think getting to like sign my name to something that is uniquely to me Mm. so like going into a communication department of any mlb team and being able to like create something and put it out and like build a brand or build something new or like find a way to expand in a way that hasn't been done, just, like, that sense of, like, innovation and creativity, Mm -hmm. being able to, like, fully embrace that in my role is kind of where I want to go to next. Like, I feel like, to an extent, like, I'm still at the point where I need to pay my dues and I need to learn and I need to gain confidence in what I'm doing Mm -hmm. before then I'm able to get to a point where I can step in and say, I know what I'm doing, here's how I want to better that. Mm -hmm. But eventually, like, my goal is to get to that point. Mm -hmm. To whatever role I'm in, in a communications department, like for an MLB team, like doing something that is, I can uniquely like, add my signature to. Yeah. And I mean, I personally would say you've already done that, especially in, in the Mizzou and in, in starting being yeah. the first female, all female broadcast team. But I'm sure, you know, and I, and I know that you can accomplish something where it's like, you don't have to have like the, the female next to it. You know yeah. what I mean? Where it's like, this is just oh, me. yeah, she she just did this. It didn't matter what her gender was yeah. or anything like that. It's like something she accomplished mm-hmm. and it's like unique to the entire, you know, s- sport or organization yeah. or whatever it is. That that's a that's a really good, yeah. you know, goal and I think, you know, it's very accomplishable. I hope so. I mean, so. as long as at the end of the day like I feel proud about what I've done and I feel that like I know my limit and I know that I've gone beyond that. Mm-hmm. It's like just where I'd feel the best. Like that is just the goal to me. I don't approach goals being like i have to have this position by this year like that's just something i'm not i've never been a fan of doing that but just knowing that like i feel good and that i went the extra mile i did this that's what i feel best about yeah yeah exactly like exceeding even your own expectations Mm -hmm. and i mean i'm sure you're the same i have very high expectations for myself and it's like um it's like you don't even know like you hear it all the time when like a a pro athlete or someone gets interviewed it's like i've exceeded everything that it's everything Mm -hmm. i've ever dreamed of or i've gone further than anything i've ever can you imagine that oh my gosh yeah like to me i feel like i just think of something else yeah like and i think that's okay right like i know at an extent like you need to be happy with what you're doing and content with what you're doing but like personally like 
I can be that and strive for more Mm -hmm. because I know when I hit a limit, it's no longer a limit to me. Yeah. And you just like build onto that. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of crazy to think that now because like, you know, we're kind of low on the totem pole, but it's like, you know, you can, you can accomplish things you never even thought of. So even now, I feel like we're both doing stuff I would have never thought that I'd be doing. Yeah. And knowing that this is also a starting point is insane. Like it just kind of opens you up to like, what else? Right. Right. And, you know, you know, there's people who work their entire careers, like, wanting to get into an industry that, you know, they enjoy more than, like, I mean, no shade, no shade at all. But, mm-hmm. like, people who work in, in like, like, if it's something you're not passionate about, yeah. you know what I mean? That was, like, my biggest fear, like, not finding a job I'm passionate about mm-hmm. and not keeping a job I'm passionate about. Yeah. It's like, oh, you get a taste of it, but no, it goes away. Mm-hmm. And then I have to go, you know, for me personally, I'd, I wouldn't want to be like a salesman at like a furniture yeah. store. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like no shade at all to them. But, but it's, like, yeah. it's like, if I end up there, I'm, I would know like, I can't, I can't start here. And yeah. feel like I go back, you mm-hmm. know? So, yeah. I and it's, it's not always the most realistic thing. And again, that comes with like resources and time and education and luck. Mm-hmm. Getting into a job where you're doing what you're passionate about and getting paid for it, like, that's just not the most realistic thing. Like, most people are doing a job so that they can work and fund their passions. Yeah. And so I think, like, with sports especially, but, I mean, both of us just personally are very fortunate. Yeah. To, like, be in love with what we're doing. Yeah. Because I just think that makes it so much better. Right. But I know a lot of people don't get the chance to do that. Yeah. And so, like you said, like, it's no shade to anybody that's just, like, chasing their passions outside of their professional life. Right. We just lucked into the idea of doing both at the same time. Exactly. Exactly. And that's, that's a perfect way to put it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that gives you time to like work on other things that you might, such as this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) So your hobbies, I know you're inspiring me. I feel like I need to pick something up. I mean, I feel like you have plenty of hobbies, you know, such as reading, um, tricking us with your card tricks and, and just, (laughs) <laughs> constantly amazing us every night which is Thank ridiculous you. um but and i mean you care for your cat like everything yeah. like there's different responsibilities and stuff that fill up your day and fill up your time but it's yeah. like I, i'm glad that the time that we spend like the, the time that we spend at our job is like not time where it's like uh, doesn't feel wasted exactly. no it definitely doesn't feel wasted exactly so no that's great and so we talk a lot about career goals what's like a life goal of yours like what what would you like to see yourself accomplish i outside of like my job which again like i love and very passionate about i think there are other pursuits that i would love to just eventually have some more time or more recess resources to the farm access us obviously (laughs) yes i would like to start a farm no. Really? Oh, okay. No, I do love the farm, and I think it's very peaceful to live in that kind of environment. Mm-hmm. And But I think, like, something I've always wanted to write a book. Oh. And I think that would be something that, like, yeah. you know, at 22 years old, I don't have that time to research and sit down and write a book in, like, a reasonable time span. Mm-hmm. I could maybe do it over the span of, like, a couple of years. But to me, that's not, like, enough for mm-hmm. what I want to pour into it. So, question. Mm-hmm. Would you write a novel or, like, a biography? I'm thinking... As of right now, like, nonfiction, but okay. in a very, like, my voice will still be captured with it. I'm not just going to write facts. It's not going to be, like, purely educational. It's going to mm-hmm. be, like, I'm pouring myself into storytelling. It's just going to be real stories. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. That sounds really cool, then. But yeah. All right. Looking forward to seeing Emma's Thank book. You. Everyone, please yeah. buy it on Keep Amazon. Keep your eyes out at Barnes & Noble. Yeah, Amazon. pre-order on yeah. Amazon. Who knows where it comes out? But no, just like that. I mean, I love to travel. I love mm. photography. Like, those are little hobbies that, like, when you're working, when you're, when you're on a grind, like, right. you don't necessarily have the time. Or if you do have the time, you don't necessarily have the energy yeah. to, like, commit to those things. Or we ask you to come with us and take pictures. Yeah, which, like, <laughs> granted, like, that is was great to me because yeah. it was, like, I'm working, yes, but it was, like, this isn't my normal job, but it was, like, a passion that I had mm-hmm. that I can use yeah. with another passion of mine. And so just, like traveling and having the time and resources to do that or like taking pictures or writing like there are little things that I would love to like 
as like personally as I go on continue to explore Mm -hmm. and I think just like different facets of my life that I don't like I dedicate most of my time and energy and my like time making resources Mm -hmm. into this passion yes but also like my professional life and so moving forward I just don't ever want those things that require time and resources Mm -hmm. to get trampled over in the pursuit of making resources yes yes I get that completely yeah it's it's all about like a balance yeah sort of okay Perfect. And I mean, what, what would it be like, what, what would be your definition of like success? Mm -hmm. I would say like, what's something where you, you'll look back and be like, like this was such a success. Just like my life is a success. What would make me feel successful? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily like your life is success because that's such like a subjective thing. Like, (laughs) yeah, that's fair. It's like, this guy had a great, this guy wins at life. Like, you know yeah, what I mean? I, yeah. I, I never really liked that term where it's like, I feel like everyone's winning, but mm-hmm. in, in, in their own. you can always win, but there's one thing to win, but it's another thing to be successful. Yeah. So I think I would consider myself like from a personal standpoint to be successful. If I've like, if I can go at the end of the day and look back at what I've done just within that day and be proud of it mm. or like at least be satisfied. Mm-hmm. I don't ever want to look back on something that I've done throughout a day and then those days build into weeks, those weeks build into months and years. Like, I never want to, as a whole, look back and feel like I didn't do enough mm-hmm. or I didn't make myself proud and make others proud. And so I think my idea of success is being like able to be proud of what you've done and then having that impact over others as well. Like, that is considered successful to me. Yeah. So it's not necessarily like, oh, I made this much money or I advanced to this much, like this role. But it's more like I created something. I'm proud of something. The people that I impacted are proud of me. Mm -hmm. That's what I would consider to be success. I think that's a really good way to look at it because then you're taking it more of like a day-to-day approach. Yeah. Instead of just like always thinking about the future, always thinking about the past. It's like, let me just focus on what's Mm -hmm. in front of me. I feel my answers are so vague and like I don't have something specific to say in terms of like a goal or success. But to me like... It's way more manageable yeah, and like just comforting when we're so busy, like we do mm-hmm. so much that at the end of the day, if I can like have find success in slowing down and like looking at everything as a whole, then I will take that. Like I'll take that win and I will take that idea of success over mm-hmm. I've hit this position, I've hit this much money, I've hit this particular goal, like that success. Like I cannot hang my hat on that kind of success at the end of the day. Big time. Yeah. It would literally probably just like take it all out of me if I'm like, I need seventy five thousand yeah. dollars by tomorrow. Like it's, it's just like, sometimes you can't control that. Yeah. Or I'm not gonna spend an entire like set of years feeling unsuccessful because I haven't hit that yet. Exactly. And I think you can find success in whatever you're doing as long as you're proud of it. And mm-hmm. as long as you're making people proud of it, you're making an impact. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean I, I love that sort I love that perspective. Mm. It's it's really good. Um Okay, I feel like this has been a very serious podcast. Yeah, I know. We've really like, gotten into like some deep conversations. Yeah, exactly. Last week with Sam, we were just cracking jokes the whole time. Talking about 8 40 wings. Yeah. <laughs> Would you believe in me, though? I do. You're I'm 100%. Real. I honestly almost think I could do it. Yeah. If I really just like, disassociated from my body and lost all saying. physical feeling. I don't, I, I just understood, like, I don't feel hunger. I don't feel fullness. Like, I just, I put them down and I deal with the consequences. I think we could do it. Yes, yeah. yes. Did you just see, did you see what the captains did on uh, Twitter the other night? I don't night? think so. What was it? Oh my gosh, you have to see it's this. about 40 wings? No, 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 no. So they had, okay, a captain's fan uh-huh. during the game had nine hot dogs, nine beers, and had to finish it before like all nine innings. No, 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 no. So, no, like like throughout the game, like oh, nine yeah. innings of baseball, so like nine hot dogs, nine beers. Like, yeah, of, in nine oh, innings no. of baseball. And he did it. I know, he felt terrible when he went home too. Well, yeah, they... Well, check the captain's Twitter. Okay. They've been posting about it. The guy is probably it's kind of funny. famous at what cost. Right, exactly. And he's like posted updates and everything. And they're like, yeah, checking in on him. He's like 24 hours later. Like he's wearing sunglasses. Like, 24 <laughs> oh, hours later, like I am not feeling good. Like uh-uh. the nine hot dogs is one thing, which is like probably manageable in three hours. You won't feel good by any means, but you could do nine hot dogs. But nine beers. A beer sits in your stomach like bread. Yeah. It's just dudes eating hot dogs and loaves of bread throughout three hours. Yeah. Like, 
Oh, man. Yeah, there's a lot of bread because you can count the hot dog bun, too. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, God. Yeah, okay, so. I hope we had some ketchup. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. Like, oh. That's what I'm saying. If you're just eating them, like, straight glizzy. Bare hot like, dogs. <laughs> straight, straight nine innings worth of glizzy. Yo. Yeah. No <laughs> way. No way. That one could maybe not be me. No, put some mustard on there or something. <laughs> like, come on. But, no, that was crazy. I thought... Oh, no, I'll go see that. Yeah, definitely. Do I want to see it? Maybe not. But I'm going to look. Yeah, it's it's manageable. So Can't look pro- away from it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So they don't really show anything too graphic. But, mm-hmm. yeah, it's 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 quite the accomplishment. He, oh. That man should be very proud of him. He feels success right now. <laughs> he does feel success. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And it helped push the captains to well, 20,000 yeah. followers. On, oh, on yeah. Twitter, so it's like, <laughs> worth it. It's like worth it. Yeah, he's contributing to that. So that would be perfect. So, mm-hmm. okay, before before we end or anything, okay. um, oh, no, I have a couple more questions. Okay, actually. that's fine. No, I'm already. Um, I wrote down some good ones, so I don't okay. want to let these go to waste. What's mm-hmm. one memory you'll take from your Cleveland experience so far? Oh. Outside of just being in an office with me every day. Of course. Yeah. Yes, yes, of course. Ugh. That's really hard. Um, maybe opening day. I think that was, like, coming off of getting to experience some community stuff, like, before that. Mm-hmm. And then having this buildup of right when opening day hit at the beginning of April, I was two months into being here. So I felt comfortable enough to be, like, aware that this is my home. Like, these are my people right now. Mm-hmm. And so coming off of the high of kind of like settling into that and then building up throughout spring training, trying to learn people. And then the first mm-hmm. week of the season hits and you like are starting to realize like, Oh, I'm connected to this yeah. team now. Oh yeah. And then opening day, like it's the first time that I was on a baseball field and I wasn't in the stands waiting to watch the people that I've grown up watching. It was new people that I was building relationships with. I was representing, I was, on like the dirt like I was right there and you're just like kind of taking it all in and it was just like so emotionally like gratifying and like yes overwhelming but not in like the negative way just like I need like being aware of a moment where you need to take it all in yeah and that's exactly what hit me when I was down there I was like I'm about to watch like these people that I'm representing and that I'm getting to know and that are like doing the exact same for me Mm mm-hmm and I'm, like, about to go up and watch this game not as, like, a fan, which is what I've always done when it comes to professional baseball. But now as, like, someone who gets to, like, it made me more of a part of it. And yeah. I think that just, like, that overall feeling in that day of, like, knowing that this was a moment that I would, like, always have made it that special for me. That's great. Yeah. That's perfect. Um, yeah, for me, when I was writing this question yesterday, for me, I thought it was, like, it was the time they took, like... Before I even moved here, uh-huh. me my dad had come with me to look at apartments. Mm-hmm. And we hung out with Bart, or not Bart, um, Austin and yeah. Court. And just walking around the ballpark, my dad is like grinning ear to ear. Yeah. He had never been in a major league ballpark before. He's mm-hmm. taking pictures of me. Oh, to see like, his he's joy. Like, he's like, here, Terrence, let me, let me get a oh. picture of you here. And I'm just like looking back. I'm like, Dad, will you relax? Like, yeah, but, but at the same time, it's like. He was so proud of me, uh-huh. and he was, like, so happy to see me, like, finally accomplish something I've been trying to accomplish since I graduated mm-hmm. last May, where it's like, oh, my gosh, look at what you're doing. Like, yeah, like, his joy for you turns into, like, your own joy. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and, like, I'll never forget that mm-hmm. moment, because that was such a cool moment of, like, having him walk around Yeah, and me. just being so proud of you. That, that's what I'm saying, like, mm-hmm. literally... He's like, all right, let me get a picture of the progressive field sign. I'm just like, damn, yeah. you relax, bro. Yeah. Like, I'm trying to drive, like, navigate. He's like, oh, there it is, there it is. And I'm Slow like, down. yeah. He's out the window. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it, it's amazing experiences that we'll never forget. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as the years go on and the different, you know, whatever roles or teams or organizations or things that we have, end yeah. up representing, it's like there'll probably be, like, one thing every year you could point back to, like, um, you know, say like kids, grandkids, niece, nephews, like are talking to you in your future. They're like, so what was it like? Like in, um, 2023, like what, what, what did you do that year? And you're thinking back to 2023, 2023. 
yeah. I was working for the Guardians. I would just scrub opening day with my eyes closed. Exactly. Like, yeah. That's going to be such a good, mm -hmm. like, such a cool experience. Just to tell people that, for sure. Yeah. And then you, like, with the advent of social media and our portable, amazing cameras, like, mm -hmm. you'll be able to show them. That yeah. Too. You're going to relive that. I'm going to be like, this is this person, or like, this is what the field looked like, or mm -hmm. like, this is me with Bert Kreischer. Yeah. I <laughs> forgot about that. Yeah. That wasn't even opening day, too. That was just the same weekend. Like, yeah. It's the best weekend ever. Yeah. It, Travis Kelsey. Oh, my gosh. It yeah. It was just so fun for me. What was it like meeting, like, because you, you grew up in Missouri. Like, yeah. Travis Kelsey's your boy. Yeah. It was it's just crazy. I'm like, I'm having this, like, surreal moment. I could care less who else is there, but it's. Yeah a super well-known player from another team and another sport that I absolutely love. It's just like, it felt like there's this tiny little piece of home there with me. Yeah. And like, I don't know him from Adam. Like I, right. I, that was the first time I'd met him. Like that is just a figure to me mm -hmm. in the NFL, but just being like, he's here, like this chiefs player. And he knows the feeling too, because he's from Ohio. Yeah. So it was just like my world's colliding in yeah. like the biggest moment possible for me. That's really cool. That's awesome. Yeah. And then the fact that you got to like meet him and yeah. shake his hand and with Bert too. I was too. an exercise in confidence. Yeah. Meeting both of them. Yeah. Having to go up and just approach these people. Yeah. Exactly. That just seemed inaccessible. And I mean, it's just telling yourself these are literally people. Like you just kind of do. Like they're people too. Yeah. So. Yeah. But I mean, it's still. But yeah, it's like it's Travis Kelsey and Bert Kreischer. <laughs> right. Like, right. Exactly. They're just really cool people. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to just. Remaining professional in those moments is truly a learning experience. Yeah, it's an exercise in control. <laughs> right, right. That's awesome. Okay, the last thing I'll ask. Okay. Um, and I, I'm sure this will probably be one of the most important things I ask you. Is mm -hmm. like, what's one thing, or like, what's one piece of advice that you would either give yourself when you were like, say, 16, 17 years okay. old, wanting to get into like the sports media space, or like a 16, 17 year old girl right now yeah. who wants to get into the sports media space. Oh, man. Um, maybe just, like, don't let your fear crush your faith in yourself. Mm. Like, I think that there's so much pressure. Mm -hmm. And especially, like, not even just the pressure that, like, externally you face, but internally, I know a lot of people create pressure for themselves, especially faced with a situation where you're growing and like you're still growing into yourself just as much as you're growing into the world around you. And there's always like doubt and anxieties or like just even like lack of resources. Like there are literal and like intangible things mm -hmm. that I think can really weigh people down. And it's so hard to be able to like, dig past that and find faith in yourself, in your own abilities, in your talents, in the people around you, and like the world. Like, it's so difficult to access all these things and think that like things are going to work out for you. Mm -hmm. But like things will work out for you, yeah. Regardless of if it's exactly what you think you're going to be doing or not. Like this is not where sixteen year old me would have thought she'd be. Yeah. But I have one hundred percent faith that this is exactly where I should be. Mm -hmm. And so just like reassuring that like you can be terrified of so many things and it's okay mm -hmm. to feel doubt and to feel anxious and to feel scared of things but just know and like hold on to that faith in yourself and your abilities to go in the direction and lead yourself in the direction that you need to go big time yeah that's perfect i think that's a great way to yeah. end it off emma thank you for coming of course, on thank you for having me you're the realist in the game twin and them. twin and them exactly <laughs> exactly coming in here on you know, half a voice. Yeah, I really appreciate okay. you it's good coming. Now. In. Yeah, exactly. No, I've talked. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. But no, thank you for yeah, coming out. Yeah, of course. On. And every, everyone, follow her Instagrams and stuff. Yeah. Do that. What's What's your um? Oh man, uh, I think my Instagram is at Emma Hayes M. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's if you search my name, it usually pops up. Okay. So. Perfect. Perfect. So you yes. tag me. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. I'll <laughs> tag you. I'll tag you too. But thank you so much. Yeah. Here you are, baby. Fresh baked pie, just for you. Where did you get this? I baked it.
from scratch. We don't have an oven. God help me. <sighs> Joseph, please. You see how that sounds, Mary?